Hello, so today we're gonna to talk about Naruto. So I just finished reading through part one for the first time and I have a lot of thoughts. I put up a community tab asking y'all how you wanted to receive this video because as I was typing up notes, I realized this is gonna, it's gonna be a long one. Um, and the barely by a sliver, the winner was to do one full really, really long video. The annoying thing is that as I continued to type up notes, I realized that I underestimated how long this video would be. If I put all of part one into one video, it would either end up being a total of like an hour and a half, maybe even more, or I would just have to do some serious condensing to make it doable. So even though one video won, I'm just gonna break it into two anyway for my own sanity and I'm so sorry if that's annoying, but I don't really wanna condense. I kinda just wanna talk about it and it just takes so much out of me to do really long videos. Anyway, I just read through part one of Naruto for the first time. I went into this series knowing nothing about it except for the goofy run and it has surprised me a lot. Lots of highs, lots of lows, and I will talk about all of them with you today. No, I won't. I'll talk about through chat through volume 12. So from early on in the series, there's so much to love. Naruto is a punk kid who plays these juvenile pranks and doesn't consider how it affects the people in the town or his classmates. And when he's made to clean up his messes, he scoffs and complains. He's a punk that wants to surpass everyone that came before him so that people will give him the respect he deserves. The audacity when I first read the way this kid's behavior and then his desire to get people to start respecting him. But we quickly learn that the reason Naruto has been ostracized his entire life is because of the nine-tailed spirit that's living in him. And his need for respect is actually a need for acceptance and love. First of all, what a reveal when it was revealed that the fox spirit that destroyed this village and ruined people's lives and was this big giant threat that people were, like that was over this village's head and that it's living inside of Naruto and the reason he doesn't have any respect, the reason he's been isolated, the reason he acts out like this is because he, well, he doesn't know about the fox spirit, but is the reason he acts out like this is because of his isolation and rejection and it's just to get someone to notice him and acknowledge him. And the reason he wants to earn the respect is because he's been so ostracized and the reason he's ostracized is because of something that's completely outside of his control. So I did a big 180 from calling him the punk kid and refusing to use his name when I would write up notes and talk on my Discord about the series to loving him and feeling so, so bad for him because he has been treated so poorly for reasons that are so outside of his control and he's just trying to make it in life. And he has had to work so hard for everything because no one would give him a chance. No one would give him a leg up. No one would teach him anything. Everything he learned, he had to learn on his own, which might be why he's so stupid sometimes. So we have that awesome setup and that leads us into the thing that ends up attaching me to the story, which is when Aruka, Iruka, Iruka, the teacher who had his whole family destroyed, killed by the fox spirit, when he sacrifices himself for Naruto to protect Naruto when he's been lulled into a trap. Iruko went to catch Naruto, but he got there in time to protect him from Mizuki's attacks. He dove in front of an attack and took a bad injury protecting this kid. I love the look on his face when he asks why. It was incomprehensible to this kid that anyone would sacrifice anything for this kid, that any that anyone would put any value on his life because he's been taught his entire life that by other people's standards, he is valueless. So when, when Ir Ir Iruka, well, he didn't reveal it. It was Mizuki that revealed. When it's revealed to Naruto that the fox spirit is living inside of him and that he is the reason, like that this thing living inside of him is the reason he's been rejected. And not only that, but this thing living inside him has harmed Iruka, well killed Iruka's entire family. And so Iruka has reason to hate Naruto. So he gets this huge bombshell dropped on him about the reason he's been ostracized his entire life, the reason he's been hated his entire life. And then that's immediately followed up by one of the people who should hate him the most giving 
him putting himself in danger for Naruto, showing him the truest, most sincere form of love. This is all in volume one, and these scenes set up some of the core themes in the series so far that I've read, or at least that I could identify. Um, some of which being Naruto, who had never experienced love, experiencing it now for the first time, and how that affected him, and how that changed him, and, and shapes who he chooses to be, but also Naruto's desire for respect, which is actually desire for acceptance and love, and how that desire is in each of us, and whether if we get it or don't get it, how that too informs how we move forward. Follow all this up with the scene where it looks like Naruto is running and it turns out that it's Iruka and Iruka is trying to warn him, but then Naruto attacks him because it turns out that it was Mizumi as Iruka and Iruka as Naruto. Did you follow that? <laughs> It was brilliant. Then Naruto is able to return the favor and defend Erika, and then we get the panel with Naruto and all of his clones. I mean, it was a great opener. I, I've, again, I've had some ups and downs with reading part one, and I do have plenty of complaints along with the praises, but I didn't expect to get attached to the story and to the characters and to the reveals this early on. So we have the trio, we have Naruto, Sa Sakura, and Sasuke, and how they are a bunch of middle schoolers with crushes. I, it's annoying, but it's also, you know, that that is kind of how middle schoolers act when they have crushes. You know, that perfect mix of, I'm being really loud right now to get your attention, but also don't look at me, but also please look at me, but also I'm gonna follow you around quietly and I hope that you'll notice me, but if you do, I'm gonna freak out. That just, that, they're annoying, but they should be, I guess. But they're forced to work together and them being forced to work together exposes their flaws as well as forces them to work together and to strengthen themselves. So other than One Piece, the last big shonen series that I read through was Dragon Ball. And I got so spoiled by the paneling of the fight scenes through Dragon Ball. So it took me a little bit to get used to the fight panels for Naruto, but I did enjoy them at the start. I think that they had some great visuals. It did a good job of not info dumping on how the magic system works and the different uh, fighting abilities that the different characters had. It did a good job of just kind of showing us in action, revealing in the moment what people were capable of doing. I didn't always feel that way throughout my reading of part one, but in the beginning, I did. So very early on, we got to an incredibly emotional scene, and that's the fight with Zebuza, Z Zabuza and Haku. We get to see through their flashbacks and through learning more about them how harsh this world is, not just to Naruto and to Sasuke, who I skipped over his backstory that we learn early on that he's on a quest for revenge because all of his people have been killed. But it's not just harsh for him. This world is harsh for a lot of people. It affects a lot of people. And once again, we we see how important that bond is. Someone who believes in you, someone who fights for you, someone who actually gives you a chance in life and how that shapes a person. It molds them. It affects who they choose to be and the path they choose to walk from there forward. It's introduced to us verbally through Haku telling Naruto, those who fight for others are the strongest, explaining how being on your own, fighting for yourself will not bring forward your greatest potential. We saw that already with Naruto's, Naruto, Sasuke, and Sakura having to work together and how that strengthened them and pushed them to be better. Sasuke, who wanted to be alone because he was so skilled, but he ended up working with them and they all got better because of it, as well as the emotional side of how having a companion informs who you choose to be. So we got that verbally, which just reinforces what we've been exploring already, but then it's shown to us through their relationship and through this fight and through what they do for each other. Haku wanted to avoid killing. He wanted to avoid the hardened life of the shinobi, but he was willing to do anything for the one person who gave him a chance, Zabuza. He would do anything for the person who was the most important to him. And then in the same fight, Sasuke sacrifices himself for Naruto. And here we cement how important they've become to each other. Kakashi said that they hadn't experienced enough loss to be hardened enough to kill. And Naruto didn't want to kill, but he was willing to as a mercy because Haku felt his life was worthless to Zabuza now that he had lost. Zabuza had called him a tool up to this point, and since he couldn't win this battle, was he really a tool worth keeping anymore? 
And what a twist when he paused what they were doing so that he could take the hit for Zabuza, dying to protect him one last time. I had also been waiting for them to change their goals ever since they realized what it actually took to become a shinobi and realized that that didn't actually align with their visions of, a sh of, of being a shinobi or their hearts. And so I was waiting for them to kind of change that. And I love that that change, that heart change, that path change was connected to these two that they had met, their bond and what they fought for and the, sta the, the stances that they took. I just, I loved this scene so much. I thought it was written so beautifully. So to inter interrupt this gush fest with some complaining, <laughs> I then watched the scene in the anime because I decided to, I, deci I decided I wanted to watch the anime alongside reading the manga. And I watched the first, I think, six episodes of the anime before I just quit. I didn't mean to, I just stopped wanting to watch it because even, even though I had a, a, a guide for which skiller, filler, which filler episodes to skip, even the canon episodes were so padded, <laughs> they were so slow that I just lost interest. And so I was like, no problem. I'll just look up the scenes that I want to watch in the anime. I'll look up what episodes they are and I'll just watch those episodes. So I did that. But this fight, which was so good <laughs> in the manga, it took up like a full volume and it was brilliant. In the anime, it took like five or six episodes and it was so drawn out and I thought that the the way that their their skills were displayed and the way it moved it just felt really nicely paced. In the anime there was so much pausing of action to give exposition or like drawing out things for no good reason. So I'm a very new anime watcher but I struggled with the anime. It was such a slog to get through even scenes that I was really excited to watch in action. Anyway, back to the gush. This was a beautiful fight. I loved seeing Naruto and Sasuke working together and really relying on each other and trusting each other. I loved seeing um, Zabuza and Haku's backstory and how Haku viewed himself as a tool, was called a tool, viewed himself as a tool, acted as a tool, but it was him stepping in as a defense for Zabuza and Naruto thinking that Zabuza didn't care about him only for us to realize that Haku was everything to him. The dying words, you were always by my side. At the very least, I can be by your side in the end, was so tragic and beautiful. And I just loved that their story wasn't just a really good side story of some villains that we fought, but it actually shifted and changed the path that Naruto and Sasuke chose to go on from their moving forward. It also showed off how tenacious Naruto is, that he will just keep throwing himself at that brick, that brick wall until it, until it breaks. He will not quit, quit trying. I'm so articulate today. He refuses to stop pushing himself no matter what. Anyway, that's something that the series, or at least part one of the series, does really well is that it establishes themes that Naruto, Sasuke, and every now and then I guess Sakura can be involved too, but mostly Naruto and Sasuke are going through their personal stories, their personal journeys, and it creates these really, really well fleshed out side characters, these really impactful characters that are in the story for a short time, but their story, while unique to them, ties into the themes that our main characters are going through so well. If you haven't been able to tell yet, I am skipping over parts that don't interest me as much. Like for instance, the bell challenge that they had to do where it was like, I have two bells. The, the two people that get the bells, actually, no, you lose because it was supposed to be all three of you. Here's some lunch. Okay, you disobeyed me. Good job, you win. Like it, I didn't care about any of that. I also didn't really care about the paper exams so much. Um, I liked that they made it impossible so that they were forced to use their ninja abilities to get the correct answers. I think that in concept it was cool, but in execution, I didn't find it very interesting and I don't have a lot to say. The murder forest, however, was quite cool. So we'll talk about that a little bit. I love the illusions in this series and the complications they add to things. Like Sasuke knowing that this was a false Naruto, so he decked him. And then the real one showed up at the last minute. Then the very next scene is a false Naruto again, but this time he could tell because Naruto wouldn't remember the password. So he attacks him again and Naruto shows up the last minute. Cheesy? 
Yes, having Naruto repeatedly, not just in this scene, but in many, many more, having him repeatedly show up at the very last moment to, to help and finish things off, it got very repetitive. But you know what? It also was kind of fun. Not to mention that these illusions are bonkers. They add a lot of complications, like they did at the beginning in that one scene that I failed to explain to you with Iruka and Naruto and Mizuki, and now in this scene. But also, they can, like, be so twisted. Like the scene where where Sasuke, it was an illusion that he was being, that he was dying. That was so freaky. I also really loved the scene where Sasuke was like paralyzed with fear and Naruto then hit him. Not because he could really tell if this is the Sasuke I know or not. He couldn't see through the illusion because he's a dope, but he did it because he was like, the, the Sasuke I know and I've bonded with, the one that I've come to respect, wouldn't act like this. So whether you're the real one or not, you deserve to be punched in the face. I love that because it happened right on the heels of Sasuke reasoning out if this was the real Naruto, Naruto or not. And I love that kind of juxtaposition of the way the two see the world and respond to the world. Also in the murder forest, we got to know Oro Orochimaru, who is just terrifying. Oh my goodness. And Rock Lee, who I didn't expect to love, but when he saved the squirrel, all bets were off. Okay, that's been enough gushing, right? Let's complain some more. Let's talk about Sakura. So we're now coming out of the murder forest and into the very long tournament uh, where we need to whittle down the number of contestants that we have uh, because everybody's so good. They have too many, so they start just facing off one-on-one. -on -one. So Sakura, um, Ino, is that her rival's name? Yeah, you know, the motivation behind the rivalry is dumb. Like, it's just, it's, we have a crush on the same boy. So, here we go. Don't get me wrong, I see the effort is there. I really do think that he actually tried to write these two women well. I just think that it, it kind of reads like, how do you do, fellow females? I've met you before. Anyway, their fight could have been so cool. <laughs> the final panels of their face off with the trap laid with the hair and Inno actually starts taking over Sakura and she starts to force her hand up to surrender the fight to quit. And it's declared in the manga, it says that this is basically impossible to get out of. Like it's done. The fight is over. I love this. I love that she was able to overpower her in this way. And it was such a tricky, cool way of doing it. And when the volume ended on her taking her over and then the next volume opened up with her raising her hand and it was like, there's no way, you lose. I was like, it was so tension filled. And then it was just like, Naruto shouts at her and she just breaks free because, just like, because I know, I know I declared that it was impossible or near impossible, but this time it worked, okay? It was such a letdown. Like all these fights that we watched in this tournament were so cool. And this one could have been really cool too. <laughs> it was just nothing. Now, Inno did say uh, that when she was inside of Sakura's consciousness and controlling her, she was like, you had two psyches. And then Sakura's response was really mysterious with her talking about um, like, you have to have a darkened core. I don't remember what she said, but her response was really mysterious. So I'm hoping that we're gonna come back around to that and we're gonna learn that there's more to Sakura than we think. And actually like she she's kind of in the Sasuke and Naruto camp in that like there's some there's some stuff going on inside of there, inside of that body that you're living in. I mean, I don't need that. It's okay to have only two internally tortured main characters and one that's slightly had a normal life, but that looked interesting. And so far Sakura's not very interesting. So if all that was was a reference to Sakura's inner self that's constantly like inserting itself in the story as an ongoing gag, I'm gonna be so disappointed. <laughs> anyway, back to the gush. Most of these fight scenes I thought were awesome. Here's a couple that I really loved. Actually, before we get into the fight scenes, there's a lot going on with Sasuke right now with his backstory, with having watched his parents be slaughtered and everybody, everybody actually be slaughtered in front of him and he was the only survivor and now he's trying to hunt down that person to get revenge. That's enough. But but now he's been bitten and I think maybe also licked by Orochimaru. Or 
and now he's cursed. And there's so much going on with that, with how it's affecting him, with him using too much chakra, making that curse then spread and take over him. And then he turns like demented. There's the fact that there's the curse is affecting him in a way that is gonna make him seek out Orochimaru and like look for training from him. He said this line, that's right, I'm an, I'm, I'm an avenger. On the path I walk, I have to do whatever it takes to gain power, even if it means selling my flesh to the devil. What? I mean, with the whole revenge thing and his kind of moody broody vibe, I kind of knew that there was a possibility that he was gonna go darker than he already kind of started as, but that line, I was like, oh, we're going full bad arc. <laughs> you're gonna, you're not gonna stay friends with us very long, are you? I mean, it was just a guess, but that line seemed like a signifier of, hey, watch him fall. Anyway, when he's under the influence of this curse, like I said, he goes dark, smiling as he breaks someone's arms and reveling in picking his opponents off. Sakura was able to knock him out of it with true love's hug or whatever. But like, how many times is this gonna work? Well, I've, I've read I've read further than this, so I can tell you not as many times as she would like. Which I do like because there's multiple times where um, their their really strong bond snaps them out of things. Like, um, like Sakura, when she's fighting against Ino, and Naruto shouts at her and that kind of kicks her out of this control that should have been basically impossible to come out of, but Naruto just shouting wasn't, anyway, sorry. There's that one, and then there's this with Sakura hugging um, Sasuke out of his possession. <laughs> and then there's um, Hinta, what's her name? The one that always goes, Naruto. She's very, I know you like her. I know you do, <laughs> because everybody in my Discord does. I find her annoying. Anyway, <laughs> please don't hate me for that. The one who has a super duper crush on Naruto, the really shy girl, uh, they also helped each other out by encouraging each other and Naruto just being around and her wanting to impress him and not wanting to give in while he's around. There, there's a lot of the people we care about, the people who we're fighting for, the people we have bonds for, they have the power to pull us out of the things that are trying to control us. So I, that's a good, ongoing thing. It's a consistent thing that's going on that kind of ties into a lot of what the series is doing, but I also really appreciate that it doesn't always work. And that, I'm getting ahead of myself now, but when, oh no, we're not even covering those volumes in this video. <laughs> this is so long. If I say I'm gonna come back to this, I will forget. Let me just talk about it for a second. The fact that Sasuke isn't always, Sakura, the fact that Sakura isn't always able to pull Sasuke out of it when he chooses his path, when he decides what decisions he's made and that he's not sticking with them, then that bond that they have doesn't pull him out of it when she tries to pull him out of it when he's fighting Naruto and it doesn't work this time. I really love that because the path you choose is another core theme in the series is that even though, I'm getting ahead of myself, sorry, <laughs> even though, there are things that are outside of our control. There are things outside of of the path that we choose for us. Sometimes, sometimes destiny is thrown on us, but we still get to choose our path. We can be overcome by that destiny and it may, you know, the curses that have been put on us may start to control us, but we can also push back against that and we can kind of force that curse to work toward the path that we're choosing, if we're willing to fight hard enough. And I just really love that the that relationships and bond and the power of love, the power of people who believe in us and people who show us that love and that respect, that those things also form us. They, those things also affect how we move forward in life. And because of that theme, we repeatedly see characters who are in these impossible situations and and just that bond with others can pull them out of it. Now, personally, I find those scenes very cheesy each time. Everyone that I just listed to you with Sakura hugging Sasuke, with um, Naruto shouting at Sakura, with the girl, the, the Naruto girl, 
every all of those scenes are the scenes are cheesy to me in application i think that they all read cheesy but it is it ties in with the theme really well about how the people the relationships they do how much they affect how we move but i also love that when sasuke chooses his path and it's against the people that he's built these bonds with that bond no longer can affect him in the same way that we've seen it displayed up to this point. Am I going on too long? I just know that if I talk about it when I'm talking about the Naruto Sasuke fight, I will forget. So I'm just talking about it here. Sorry. It's a long video, I know. But anyway, I love the scene where Naruto creates all the doppelgangers and pretends that he's run out of chi, but they were just a distraction as he impersonated the team so that the others could sneak up behind. It's nice to see this character that up to this point has just kind of rammed himself against the wall until finally the wall breaks, like in the Zabuza and, and Haku fight. But now we're actually seeing him grow and improve as a fighter. Now he's using strategy. Now he's using cunning and trickery to be able to use utilize these same tricks. You know, he has one bag of tricks, but he can use them more effectively because he's starting to use his brain a little bit more. So it's nice to see that slow evolution in him. And then we get to the tournament fights again. I loved the Naruto and Kiba fight because again, we see this dope main character use ingenuity and skill. He's a trickster, which fits really well with the personality that we knew him as in the introduction of the series. Now let's talk about the Rock Lee and Gara fight. I love Rock Lee. He is a normal kid fighting among giants. He's fighting among all of these people who are so skilled and have so many unique abilities that, that he has no access to, but through his tenacity, just like Naruto, except that Naruto actually has the, you know, demon. But Rock Lee doesn't have any of that. All he has is his unwillingness to quit and his devotion to his goal, to his dream, to the path he's chosen, and to Guy, the one who believed in him. So again, so much of the themes are tucked into this side character as well. The fact that Guy believing in him meant so much to him. The fact that he can choose his own path and fight for it, even if the curse that's on him, which to him, the curse is not having a curse. The curse for him is that he doesn't have one of these specialties that he just has to fight. He just has to work and force him, force life to allow him to walk down this path. I mean, his taijutsu is so good that Sasuke mimicked his moves. This fight was incredible to watch from the scene where he dropped the weights and we realize how fast he truly is to the fact that he was actually able to gain hits on Gara, which was impossible. That was impossible. But he did. He is the embodiment of overcoming all odds through hard work. And it sucks that he was teamed up with Gara <laughs> because Gara is like, the most impossible opponent for him. So that was so tragic for me. I'm so sad that he lost, but I have hope. I mean, we already see another great scene of his that we'll explain, that we'll talk about in the next video, but I have hope that we're going to see a lot more of him and a lot more is gonna be done with him. And I don't want him to get a superpower. I don't want him to learn any sort of ninjutsu. I just, I want him to continue to be the normie who just pushes himself and fights and works and it pays off and he's able to accomplish what he what his goals are i just i really love him i i really really love him i'm just gonna note this scene here the fact that guy steps in and ends the fight on um rock lee's behalf and we're gonna unpack that in several more minutes. So next we have some more complaining. So Naruto gets his own pervy mentor. Um, so anytime I critique perv gags that I feel have gone too far, it always ruffles some feathers. So protect your feathers because I'm going to talk about this for a minute. So the centerfold ninjutsu nonsense that is introduced at the beginning of the series with Naruto, I don't like it. It's already an awkward, hey, if you think about this too hard, a kid is doing this and making adults think about said kid in a certain kind of way. So like, maybe don't think about it too hard. But it's taken so much farther with this mentor whose name I never bothered to learn. When Naruto shows him the centerfold thing to distract him and his response is, his response was, at first he was telling Naruto, I'm not gonna train you. I don't want to, I'm not gonna do it. Find somebody else. And then Naruto does that. And then his response is, okay, I'll train you. 
but only if you use that form the whole time. So now it's not even this awkward, okay, it's a quick scene and then we move on, let's not think about it too hard. It's actually an adult who's looking a kid in the eyes and saying, hey, when you make yourself look like that, you're my type. So can you keep looking like that so that I can keep watching you? Can you stay in that form for me the whole time that you're around me? He's still a kid. He's just changing his appearance for a second. And I feel like the bar is so low to just say, please keep kids out of your pervy gags, at least. And I know that this was written in a different time, but it's still open for analysis, just like the rest of the series is. Back to the gush. So Naruto trains up and he gets access to this fox spirit. I love the line, hey, stupid fox, I've been letting you live in my body all this time, so why don't you pay me some rent and lend me your chakra? Oh, that was such a cool line. That was such a cool line by this derpy kid. I loved it so much. I also love the whole sequence of just like, chuck the kid off the cliff, child talks to inner spirit living inside of him, poof, giant frog appears. Like this whole sequence is so funny to me. And it's also another display of how hard Naruto works, how much he trains and pushes himself and will not give up to be able to gain the next power up. So I like that because he's born with this incredibly crazy power sp powerful spirit living inside of him that he has access to and that gives him a leg up, but it's also a curse. It also gives him a disadvantage and it he also it's not like he's just born with this crazy intense power that he just has access to he around every corner of this story is pushing himself and pushing himself and pushing himself to to get to where he ends up going it's not like if he didn't apply himself he'd land in the same place in the story he wouldn't go anywhere in the story actually boy did i not expect this villain to be my top character in the series so far. His life is a tragedy. He had his future stolen from him and he was used like a tool, only to be completely rejected and deemed a liability and then hunted down and killed by the ones who made him into this. He's never experienced love, only pain and rejection. He's never actually been treated like a human and now acting like a weapon is the only thing he knows. I feel so bad for him. He's basically the dark timeline Naruto. And the fact that the tattoo on his forehead reads love and love is the one thing that has always been denied of him is so sad. And two, once I saw this backstory, it recontextualized everything with Lee, uh, with no, with Guy, who protected Rock Lee. Whereas Naruto, who was always rejected, always denied love, a curse was thrust on him against his will, and now everybody hates him and, and stays away from him because of it. We also have, um, we also have Gara, who has the same story, but Naruto was shown love by someone who could have hated him, choosing to love him. And with Gara, we saw him have the exact same backstory, but the way he sees love displayed is through Guy stepping in and protecting Rock Lee. It's a selfless love that was displayed to him, but in this case, it was displayed for someone else. And that affects him, which will come back to in just a minute. But first, Naruto and the fox. Oh, next thing in my note is another complaint. Sorry. So Naruto, he's been training like crazy to get this, to get access to the chakra of the fox spirit and to be able to coexist with this thing and use it uh, to his advantage. Like he's been training so hard. And then he goes into a battle, hears a story about some twins and just forgets everything. He actually has the line, that's right, the fox chakra. Dummy, what have you been doing all this time? What have you been learning about and, and fighting for? What? 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 Sometimes this kid, man, it's too much. Oh, my bad. I thought we were going to end this video talking about Gara confronting Rock Lee in the hospital and then unpacking more of my analysis on Gara, but we're not. We're actually going to end this video talking about the Neji? Oh, golly, I'm so sorry. I don't know how to pronounce that one. The fight between Naruto and another character. When the stuff is on the screen, you'll you'll see. Okay, so the twin story was dumb. So we got like a backstory about these twins and them choosing their own path and their identities getting mixed around. And I'm not going to summarize the whole thing for it for you. I thought it was pretty convoluted, convoluted and 
I didn't like it. But I am going to talk to you about the fight with them as well as what I, how I've interpreted this whole section. The thing that I got from the twin story, at least the purpose that I saw in it, was that you may be destined for one path, but you can still forge your own, which again fits perfectly with the themes that we've already had established in the story, or rather that we're already building up at this point in the story with Naruto and with Sasuke and with Gara and with uh, Rock Lee and with Zabuza and Haku, like all over the place, this theme is being built up. And the twin thing to me just kind of reinforces that thing that will continue to be expanded on throughout the rest of part one. And that ties in nicely with the fact that Naruto didn't choose to be bound with this fox spirit, but that he's learning to utilize it so that he can forge his own path with it. It can control him, it can overtake him, but he can learn to control it instead of it controlling him so that he can use it. For Naruto and for Gara and for Sasuke and for so many characters, their cur curse could be their undoing. It could be the thing that destroys them or they can use that curse for their benefit. They can use that curse to forge their own path. Okay, that's the first video. That's the first 12 volumes. Next week, on Monday, it's gonna be a One Piece video. So next week on Friday, we will talk about the next volumes and my favorite scenes are in these volumes. Even though there were so many great things in, in these first 12, the next, however many, contain my favorite parts of the series so far. So I'm really, really excited to dig into those two. Sorry this is long. Sorry the next one will be long too. I don't know. I don't have any excuses. I just have long videos apparently. Anyway, I would love to talk with you more about any of this in the comments. So please do chat with me more. If there's any scenes, again, this is my first read through. So if there's any scenes that I misinterpreted or that you'd like to elaborate on that I maybe missed some, some sections on or you wanna build on some things that I said, I would love to chat with you more in the comments. I post videos every Monday and Friday on this channel, Tuesdays, Thursdays, and Saturdays on the book channel, always linked in the description. I'll see you again soon, bye.